Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our distinguished speakers and participants from around the world. My name is Anne Reho, and I'm the Acting Executive Director of the United Nations Office for Partnerships and the Senior Communications Advisor in the Executive Office of the Secretary General. It's my privilege to welcome everyone. We are honored to co-host this virtual open dialogue on science for development in the context of COVID-19, together with the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and the Government of Canada. COVID-19 is a global health, social, economic, and humanitarian crisis, exposing inequalities around sectors across the world. The pandemic has also made evident the need for a transformation guided by science, hence the launch of the UN Research Roadmap last November that was built on the Secretary General's UN framework for the immediate social economic response to COVID-19. Developed through a global participatory process, the UN Research Roadmap lays out 25 high impact research priorities and scientific strategies to support an equitable recovery, particularly focusing on the importance of international collaboration through the power of science. I wish to acknowledge Stephen Hoffman his colleagues at the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and the global research community, which took part in producing the UN Research Roadmap. Yesterday, as the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres set out in his 2021 priorities, he said, science is succeeding, but solidarity is failing. Judging by the number and the variety of participants in today's dialogue, we aim to ensure science and solidarity succeed for people and for the planet. Today, we strengthen the connection between research funding agencies and researchers globally, UN officials, permanent representatives and delegates from more than 100 permanent missions here in New York. And we will be joined by the UN Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed, in about 30 minutes. This is a rare opportunity for an open conversation on how we can further collaborate on COVID-19 recovery efforts through global research and in support of the decade of action to deliver the SDGs. This is a dialogue. So we are going to do, our moderators will do their best to accommodate all requests, factoring considerations, including geographic representation and gender balance. We apologize in advance to any delegations who may not ultimately be able to take the floor, but hope that this can be the first in the series of discussions that we will have on how best to take forward this work, and we will follow up on any outstanding questions. May I also ask that everyone please mute your microphones when not speaking, and to remember to turn on your microphone when you take the floor. Now, it is my great honor to introduce the permanent representative of Canada, His Excellency, Mr. Bob Ray, you have the floor. Uh, merci beaucoup, uh, Anne-Marie, and merci au bureau des partenariats de l'ONU ainsi qu'aux instituts de recherche en santé du Canada pour votre appui dans l'organisation de cet événement qui est tellement important. I'd like to thank uh, the UN Office for Partnerships and UN Marie and the Canadian Institute for Health Research for support in organizing this very important event. It's a, it's a pleasure for me to be joining you all this morning as we bring together a variety of stakeholders and mark the recent launch of the UN Research Roadmap for the COVID-19 recovery. This event is needless to say, timely and topical as we come together to recognize the need for an even stronger partnership between science and political will and global collaboration. These things must work together. We must go from ideas to policy. Science in our view is the linchpin of the COVID-19 pandemic response and recovery. And in fact, as the secretary general said yesterday, we've made remarkable steps in advancing a scientific response to recovery in terms of diagnostics, effective treatments and vaccines. It's at the heart of recovery, but there has to be a link between these achievements and our political will, our willingness to move forward with efficient, equitable and sustainable recovery efforts and help us to get back on track for the SDGs. Our mission is very proud that a fellow Canadian was asked to lead this work, but I, we're also very proud that it was a truly global effort. 
Researchers from around the world have contributed to this, some of whom are with us today. We're delighted to have this opportunity to work with so many other countries and the United Nations to help to bolster the, the power of science in achieving the sustainable development goals. Uh, this is an enormous opportunity for us to link together researchers, policymakers, governments, and the UN. But I, I think the thing we have to really reflect on is how do we take this discussion into the world of actual implementation? And I think this is something that we really need to discuss and focus on as, as we go forward. I'm not going to turn it over to Dr. Hoffman. Stephen Hoffman was asked to lead this process by the United Nations. He's no stranger to the UN, having worked with the WHO in Geneva, the executive office of former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon here in New York City. He's currently the scientific director of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, a professor at York University and the director of the WHO Collaborating Center. Dr. Hoffman, I wanna congratulate you personally on the roadmap and now the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Great. Ambassador Ray, thank you very much uh, for your kind remarks um, and that introduction. Very much appreciate it and your leadership. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining this open dialogue. First, I wanted to say that I'm pleased to join everyone today uh, from Toronto, Canada, which is located on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and now home to many diverse First Nations Inuit and Métis people. I'll briefly present at this time um, about the UN Research Roadmap for the COVID-19 recovery, after which I have the honor of moderating the first of two dialogues on how science can contribute to recovering more equitably, resiliently, and sustainably from the COVID-19 pandemic. The starting point for this project, as the uh, slides uh, will hopefully uh, soon show for everyone to be able to see, are that we have been living in a world not only facing a pandemic of a virus, but also a pandemic of unfairness, a pandemic of socioeconomic consequences. And as a result, uh, what that means is that we're at a time in our history where after many years of sustained progress across nearly every indicator of human development, 2020 was a year when many of those indicators regressed. And so as the next slide highlights, we'll see that um, when we then look at the sustainable development goals, which represents that unifying vision that every UN member state uh, adopted in 2015, we see that not only are we not, in this past year, did we not make progress, but actually, of course, we saw some backsliding as well. When it comes to poverty in 2020, it's estimated that 71 million people were pushed into extreme poverty. When it comes to quality education, at some point last year, 90% of kids were out of school at different times. When it comes to gender equality, uh, cases of domestic violence increased by up to 30% in some countries. And 60% of countries reported prison overcrowding. These are just simply a few statistics that highlight, again, that this isn't just a pandemic of a virus. Of course, it is that too but it's also a pandemic of inequities that require uh, a robust response at the same time. Next slide. And so in its vision um, and in, through its leadership, the United Nations uh, at the very start of this pandemic recognized that this was going to be a pandemic of a virus as well as a pandemic of inequities. And as a result, uh, developed a UN framework for the immediate socioeconomic response to COVID-19. I think this is an extraordinary effort that the UN did. It was one, it was an attempt to ensure that the entire UN system could deliver for member states and for the world. And in that framework, the UN wisely identified five key areas that were in need of urgent attention both in terms of the UN's immediate response to this outbreak, as well as, of course, member states, civil society, businesses, and all sectors. Those five areas were the health services and systems, second, social protection and basic services, third, economic response and recovery, fourth, macroeconomic response and multilateral collaboration, and fifth, social cohesion and community resilience. Next slide. Recognizing that, of course, a framework for action is great, 
But even better would be if that framework for action could first make use of the best available science in order to inform that action. And second, ensure that we have a rapid learning initiative whereby later actions in the recovery period and the response period can be informed by learnings from earlier lessons, the UN Deputy Secretary General invited the development of a research roadmap for the COVID-19 recovery. This roadmap was developed in collaboration with research leaders from around the world, many of whom have joined us today, as well as we engaged over 270 experts. Uh, there were written submissions, there were virtual consultations, key informant interviews, and we also commissioned five rapid scoping reviews. The idea behind that was making sure that we could build on the best available knowledge as we already know it in identifying priorities for going forward. All of this was done in 10 weeks, which is how things have to move in the context of a pandemic. And we're just so grateful to everyone who joined in this effort, despite the short timeline in order to make it possible. And especially to the team behind the scenes that made it all happen. Next slide. And so in this research roadmap, which I'll encourage everyone to look at if you haven't already done so, the intention behind it, or that's its, its vision, is that yes, we are faced in this moment where we are seeing so much as that's taking us a step backwards from achieving the sustainable development goals. But at the same time, this pandemic represents a generational moment to try to achieve the kind of transformational changes that we know are desperately needed in order to achieve that better and brighter future envisioned by the Sustainable Development Goals. And on the next slide, it highlights that essentially we're at a moment where we have a choice. We know there's gonna be extraordinary actions taking place over this year and the years to come that will set us on path dependencies going towards the future. And so the question is, do we wanna go back to business as usual, which has the advantage of we know how to do it, we've done it before, but that path of going back to business as usual is deeply unsatisfying because as everyone here knows, the world as it was before this pandemic was also not perfect. And indeed for many people, uh, too many people were left behind. And so as a result, it's clear that that better future, a more equitable, resilient, and sustainable future requires those kind of transformational changes. The challenge, of course, is that we don't fully know what exactly those transformational changes are, and we don't know how to fully implement them. The good news is when we don't know something, that's when we call upon science. That's when we have to engage science, and that's the role that science must play both in terms of the immediate response to this pandemic, as well as serving as that guiding force to get to a more equitable, a more resilient and more sustainable future. Next slide. And so together, what this roadmap attempts to achieve is it identifies 25 top level research priorities across those five pillars of the UN's existing socioeconomic framework for the immediate response to COVID-19. It was essentially through a process working with colleagues around the world, we identified five top level research priorities for each of those five pillars, along with additional sub priorities and contextual information. Second, we provide a framework for understanding the challenges we currently face and the opportunities ahead. And third, we highlight five science strategies that can strengthen the role of science in a recovery. Next slide. Ultimately, when thinking about the 25 research priorities that were identified, which I won't go through because we wanna to get to the dialogue and discussion, which is the focus of this event, I did wanna highlight that we can though see the 25 research priorities as all working together to answer a singularly important overarching question. Next slide. And that question is really about and recognizing that during this time, we are going to see extraordinary change in all societies around the world. How can we ensure that those changes achieve not only the direct benefit that they're trying to achieve, but also that they're purposefully designed, strategically designed to also stimulate equity, resilience and sustainability and progress towards the sustainable development goals. In a sense, as the next slide shows, 
how can we ensure that our recovery efforts and our response efforts to COVID-19 achieve a quadruple bottom line? So we achieve those direct benefits and a, a, even better than that would be one co-benefit, even better two co-benefits, even better all three at the same time. And indeed, the challenge with this, of course, is that it's not easy. And that's where we need science. And this UN Research Roadmap highlights numerous opportunities to aim for that quadruple bottom line so that our interventions can have the biggest impact wherever possible. Next slide. And of course, it's very important to emphasize that we need to achieve that quadruple bottom line. Because if we don't, we leave our systems uh, vulnerable to future threats that will inevitably come our way. And so as this figure shows, even if we get a double bottom line and we're able to advance equity or a triple bottom line in advancing sustainability so that we live within our planetary boundaries, we still won't be able to achieve the kind of recovery that we need if we also don't build in resilience, for example, because as this figure shows in a three-legged stool, when one drops uh, the whole system can face challenges. Next slide. And so with that, let me just turn to uh, recognizing that as much as we need research and science to inform the full range of policies and changes that will come both during this pandemic and after, we also need to take a critical look at how can we strengthen our science systems within all societies around the world. And so in the next slide, it highlights the five science strategies that were identified and emphasized in the UN Research Roadmap for the COVID-19 recovery. The first is on data. Of course, uh, this is nothing new. Uh, we know that data-driven change and action is going to be better and more impactful than actions that are made in the absence of data. But of course, data needs more than that information, points of information. It needs, of course, all the organizations, policies, technologies in order to ensure its collection, storage, oversight, privacy, and use of that resource. Second, there's an emphasis on implementation science. This is out of recognition that even if we know what kind of interventions will work, we don't necessarily know how to implement them, in which context will they work, for which populations, in what ways. And the good news is that there is a budding area of science that is specifically focused on better understanding how interventions work across different contexts in order to allow interventions to be adapted for those contexts and ensure that when implemented, they can be more successful. Third, this, the research roadmap emphasizes rapid learning systems. This is essentially recognizing that when we implement ambitious programs, we can't wait until the very end to learn whether they had impact or to know how they should be changed. We need to have learnings earlier on in that implementation so that tweaks can be made in order to maximize impact. Fourth, knowledge mobilization. This is recognizing that we can, even, we can generate a lot of knowledge, but it's not going to be helpful unless additional efforts are taken to ensure it can be picked up and made use of by, by those who have the ability to act upon that. And fifth, we need to bolster the science of science, essentially research on research, which is needed in order to strengthen our scientific systems. And indeed, in the science world, if we are committed to ensuring that our work can have an impact on policy and practices and programs, we then also need to take a critical look at our own systems to make sure they also are evidence-based and most impactful. Next slide. With that, the research roadmap ends with a call to action. Of course, it's a call to action for researchers who need to tackle the various complex research priorities identified through this process and others in order to achieve those transformative changes that are desperately needed. Second, uh, we need research funding agencies, many of which are represented today at this meeting, who need to work together to ensure that sufficient and coordinated investments are available to address the priorities. Third, governments and civil society organizations are critical, both in terms of asking for research that they need to inform recovery efforts, as well as to encourage support and enable the institutionalization of the use of research evidence in their own decision-making processes. With that, um, I will turn to a focus on today's meeting as shown in the next slide. 
This is uh, an open dialogue uh, with the UN Deputy Secretary General, uh, who will be joining us uh, very shortly, along with the heads of international research funding agencies on science in the development and for development in the context of COVID-19. And I'm delighted that over a hundred uh, UN member state missions are also represented on, at today's meeting. There will be two dialogues. The first one I have the honor of moderating. This one will focus on how can science contribute to recovering more equitably, resiliently, and sustainably from the COVID-19 pandemic. And then my colleague Christian Salazar Volkman will be moderating a second dialogue on what are the best strategies for improving collaboration among the world's research funding agencies, research institutions, and the United Nations. As I mentioned, and as Anne-Marie mentioned at the very beginning, this is a dialogue. So we will do our very best to accommodate as many voices as possible. We're here today, as I mentioned, with over 40 international research funding agencies, diplomats from over 100 member state missions, numerous senior leaders from UN agencies, programs and entities, and thousands of observers who are watching via the UN web TV platform. So I'll kindly ask that anyone who wishes to take the floor, please indicate so in the chat box. We anticipate many of you will wish to take the floor. And so we ask, please to keep your interventions to no more than two minutes. Now that's really important, especially as I've been asked to step in if remarks go longer than two minutes. So please do help me by saving me from the awkwardness of having to interrupt your important interventions on a virtual platform. We have a great organizing team that's working behind the scenes to receive all your requests that you make to speak in the chat box and to accommodate as many as possible. As Anne-Marie mentioned, trying to balance considerations including gen geographic representation and gender balance. And let me just apologize in advance to anyone who's not able to speak and take the floor, but we will do our very best. And a reminder uh, for those to please keep your microphones muted when not speaking. And of course, then to remember to turn on your microphone when you're asked to do so. So with that, let's launch right into the very first dialogue of two uh, on how science can contribute to recovering more equitably, resiliently and sustainably from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And for that, I will turn first, I see in our speaking list, let me turn to uh, Professor Jeremy Farrar, director of the Wellcome Trust, after which I will go to Professor Nicia Trinidad Lima, president of Fiocruz Oswaldo Cruz Foundation in Brazil, followed by Professor VK Malhotra, Member Secretary of the Indian Council of Social Sciences Research. Professor Farrar, Farrar the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen, and Excellencies, uh, United Nations, the United Nations Office for Partnerships, uh, the Government of Canada and the Canadian Institute of Health Research. It's an honor to join you today, and I'm delighted to see the United Nations system led by the Secretary General and Deputy Secretary General of, of giving such prominence to research. And thank you to the wonderful team at the Canadian Institute of Health Research uh, for all you've done in this. This pandemic has affected everybody's life in every country. There's been the direct health consequences, two million deaths tragically already, and in truth, very many more. There's been the indirect consequences of everybody's health as well, whether cancer or maternal child health. There's been the impact on jobs, on livelihoods, on education on a growing inequality and trust in government, and it's unraveled the tensions in all of our societies. It's also affected everybody's economy and the finances, and it's put back the sustainable development goals by potentially as many years. And it's also had an impact on geopolitics. The truth is that these are the challenges of the 21st century, and there will be very many similar drivers in climate, in mental health, in inequality, in energy and water access. And how we deal with this in many ways will define how we wish the 21st century to play out. These are our challenges and we now face some choices. Science is the exit strategy from this pandemic and it's also the way to address these great challenges of our time. And if we are to achieve this kind of transformational change, then we need all of our societies to come together to reach our collective aspirations. But that is no good unless we make that science equitably available to everybody in the world that needs them. Doing the science is the first part. It's no good unless we make that equitably available. And I think that's why we've come together today. And science means leveraging all the fields of science. It means social sciences, history of science. It means the arts, the humanities. It means involving people, not engaging with people. And it means shifting the center of gravity. And the United Nations Research Roadmap, I think, is the best way of pointing us to the future. 
but it is our responsibility now to turn that roadmap into real action. We are facing one of those moments in history when humanity has a choice and a fork in the road, and we now face that choice. We can blame complexity, we can say it's too hard, we can look the other way, and we can retreat into insular nationalism, or we can come together to address the challenges of the 21st century. There is nobody else out there that can do this. This is us. This will help define the world in the 21st century. Too often we have warm words. We need to lift our eyes, we need to see what's possible, and then we need to take responsibility as we leave these meetings to deliver on our commitments. If not us, at this moment in history, then who will do it? Stephen, back to you. Professor Farr, thank you very much. I'll now turn uh, the floor to Professor Nicia Trindad Lima, president of Fio Cruz in Brazil. Oh, president Nicia, you'll have to unmute. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Well, good, ma good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, for everyone. I'd like to thank you to, to the, for the invitation. Uh, the opportunity to participate in this important exercise. And let me congratulate you on the excellent results obtained in a record time. We share the views that the recovering better from the challenges resulting from COVID-19 will require global solidarity and innovation, improve the lives of the population in a vulnerable situation, and include the most marginalized. I think that's one important point in our roadmap. The five pillars and 25 research priorities, as well the five science strategies showed us by Stephen Hoffman is very important. I would like to reinforce the importance of science of science. Uh, how deal with the data, how deal with the scientific organization to achieve the goals. The UN research roadmap for the COVID-19 recovery will be relevant to our inst institutional effort to support the 2030 agenda. In the new, near future, we hope to share a Portuguese version of the roadmap met with the few clues in the Brazilian scientific communities to review it and establish concrete activities that will strengthen our national and international collaboration. The priorities under the pillar on health systems and services certainly are that we have more experience and will continue making contributions. Research and innovation are essential to improve the local production, achieve the national autosufficiency of essential health products, and promote equitable access through the Brazilian Unified Health System, the Brazilian Health System. Fio Cruz, I, I think that one important point in this perspective is the access to vaccine. And we are working very hard to this, to this goal here at Fiocruz. Fiocruz also has a diversity of research activities that will contribute to all other pillars and priorities, especially with our innovation program. Uh, it's a mechanism to promote innovation, interdisciplinary approaches, and certainly will benefit from the roadmap and you contribute to its implementation. Thank you very much. Professor, thank you very much. I'll now turn the floor to Professor VK Mahaltra, Member Secretary of the Indian Council of Social Sciences Research. The floor is yours, thank you. Uh, thank you, Hoffman. Uh, Excellency from UN, friends from Francis policymakers, funding agencies, the research leaders, civil society organizations, which are being represented here, in fact. Uh, uh, I mean, if I talk of what we have tried to do during this period in this connection, and uh, I'm, I'm very delighted to be part of this exercise through which we have reached this UN research roadmap for the COVID-19 recovery, and uh, which is spread over uh, five pillars and 25 questions. I know that there are some questions 
which are society specific also and which need to be captured. I'm very, very delighted to see, uh, I mean, how these different strategies are being talked about and uh, on which the research is supposed to concentrate in days to come. I'm reminded of our own experience here in India at Indian Council of Social Science Research when we went out with the call sometimes in the last week of April and first week of May. We were not expecting much of the response around these areas, in fact. But when the call ended, we had received almost 1,200 applications for the projects. And uh, yesterday itself, we have finalized the awards against those applications. And I find that most of these fields that we are interested in knowing, and obviously, all, all researches are finally supposed to lead to our better understanding of the data, which is, which is the basic thing. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy to see that most of us are talking about science of science and wherein we intend to talk about how funding has to be mobilized, practiced, and how researchers need to be evaluated in days to come so that they could be utilized to their best uh, for the betterment of the humanity on the whole. In fact, it's, a, it's a, any, any problem, uh, most of the, I mean, such kind of problems are unprecedented in nature and they would definitely need uh, uh, a great effort in understanding those so that if there are any such challenges in future, the, the world on the whole and as one unit can understand those problems much in advance and can think in terms of solutions to those, those issues. And I think this is wherein the, the issue of uh, resilience uh, and when resilience is there, obviously sustainability and equality can be easily achieved. Uh, I, I believe uh, the whole world is now concentrating on the equity issue uh, in much greater extent than it ever used to. So uh, just to put it on record, we have also organized some webinars with our international collaborators in these contexts. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Professor. I'll now turn the floor to Ambassador Edrez of Egypt. Ambassador, the floor is yours, thank you. Good morning, thank you very much. Really highly appreciate this uh, opportunity to engage in uh, this important topic. Uh, thank, thank the DSG, my friend Ambassador Bob Ray and all our dear Segus researchers who enriched uh, this session. Uh, let me just to, to, to refer that it's very, it's indeed a virtue that we uh, depend on science and technology in addressing our issues. So this in itself is a virtue which we have to commend uh, this endeavor uh, to pursue. Uh, at the same time, also, I think th this, uh, uh, we need science and technology not only to address the current challenges, but or to understand the current reality, but also to foresee what is ahead of us and to foresee what challenges we are facing. For example, we were facing and still the challenge of the virus. I think we also are having the challenge of the vaccine and how are we going to provide this vaccine in an accessible manner and equitable manner. So always uh, forging ahead and looking far ahead is important. The other point is the context based of this. The 25 priorities. They are all important in the, in the, in the, in, on the merits. And I think one context-based aspect is important. These are priorities for whom and uh, for what part of the world and on what area. Uh, this, I think, is a, the context-based aspect is important. The, uh, the virus has, uh, uh, over, has exposed the vulnerabilities and the interlinkage between different challenges we're facing. So the solutions also, I think, needs to be so much also uh, interlinked together. The point about technology and science, the, we talk about the cutting edge science, top technology. I think the merit here is applicability and to enable the countries, very especially developing countries, to have technology which is applicable and which is also uh, local. Because depending also always on importing uh, technology, uh, will put them always in vulnerability. So I think the, the top technology is the technology which is applicable and which can be uh, also cultivated uh, locally. Uh, I, I think also one important aspect is the follow-up, how we can also follow up the applicability, follow up and create success stories. 
this is, uh, is important because many of the solutions are known, they are not uh, uh, hidden, but maybe uh, we did not pursue it because there was no, maybe not enough uh, awareness, not enough uh, political will. Uh, maybe now I fully agree that uh, if uh, this current situation will not drive us to change the mindset and put our action together, so what will do? Uh, what is the threshold of pain and suffering which we need in order to be really a uh, practical oriented? The last point is the role of the UN in this. Definitely this is an enrichment of multilateralism. The UN is the only body which can harness all this expertise and then inject it into the local uh, field uh, in the different countries, especially developing countries. And it's important, I think, to uh, uh, through the UN presence uh, in, in, at the country level, to make use of these researches, of these ideas, and to try to cultivate success stories and to present it in order to incentivize for more work uh, uh, to, to follow. So I think I just want to stop here for the sake of time and appreciate and thank this precious opportunity. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Ambassador. At this time, I'm pleased to welcome Her Excellency Amina Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations and Chair of the UN Sustainable Development Group. Madam DSG, please let me first thank you for your inspiring work throughout the ongoing pandemic and for championing the power of science to recover better from it, most notably by your inviting the developments of the UN Research Roadmap for the COVID-19 recovery. For your leadership, we are deeply grateful. Madam DSG, the floor. Thank, thank you very much. And um, as, as we often say here, uh, please know uh, excellencies. It is colleagues, it's friends, um, and the many people who've come together to support what we do in terms of a response um, to what has been a huge crisis. Um, and we are still in response mode, even though we always are speaking to um, the recovery. Uh, thank you, Stephen and, and Anne-Marie. It's been huge work that you've been asked to lift in, in record time. Uh, your teams have done an excellent job and I want to thank my colleague um, and uh, uh, Ambassador Ray who we work together on many issues and it's great to see us here um, with the Canadian Institute of Health Research. Our speakers, um, I was trying to sort of multitask and so I did hear from Jeremy and from Professor Lima and, and, and Professor Malhotra, thank you so much for your remarks. I think it's incredibly important that we are constantly looking at the equity of everything and anything, and that we are seeing all um, the fields of science involved in this. And I think much more importantly, I think Jeremy underscored the need for us, um, not just to, um, as they say, uh, look to people um, by engaging, but really involving them in the implementation. So uh, we are, of course, a, a fork in the road, and I'm really pleased that we're here today among representatives from member states and leaders of our world research funding. So really huge um, and important stakeholder community uh, that we have this discussion today. We've heard that the pandemic has had far reaching consequences, um, socioeconomic health impacts disproportion disproportionately, they have affected the most marginalized. And the response to the pandemic has pushed more than 70 million extra people into poverty. But I would say it's also questioned vulnerability and uh, away from just our low income countries, the, low, uh, the least developed countries to middle income countries with huge in inequities and uh, populations. So really that, that word vulnerability, I think to be better understood so that we are capturing um, everyone and, and not leaving vast communities behind. Last year has served as a reminder that the advances we've made towards the SDGs are extremely fragile. COVID exacerbated it, it was a big wake up call. With the release of the UN Research uh, Roadmap, uh, for us, we see here um, the aim to mobilize and to inspire a coordinated effort, particularly at the country level, um, with strategies that are informed by rigorous scientific evidence and where solutions towards the SDGs um, actually happen. Uh, we're grounded in an ambitious socioeconomic response uh, and the framework that we put into place really try to put um, development in emergency mode. Um, and as of January, uh, we know that around our countries, 118 governments and country teams have these economic response plans. Uh, $2 billion in new funds have been mobilized. 
Um, I think, and really importantly, to see how we have pivoted, $3 billion have been repurposed to help us to do our work in supporting our countries and communities. And we've seen many country teams uh, do this towards the um, COVID-19 response. With UN support, we've got socioeconomic response plans that are being rolled out in 75 countries. So there's a lot of work going on. It's how to inform that and get that to the scale, urgency and ambition that we would like to see. Over the past year, we have seen the great power and potential of science and global scientific collaboration. And I do remember five, six years ago when we really went through the efforts of framing the SDGs um, academia and the science community were a very big part of it as we looked at the indicators and the science behind what a result would look like over 15 years. While much deserved attention has focused on immediate development of treatments um, and vaccines for COVID, the same focus and attention needs to be given to the urgent socioeconomic issues caused by the pandemic. COVID has made it evident that we must build a new future through a lot of transformative changes. So the reforms we have been doing in the UN, this really needs to see the way we work and the way we respond to the new challenges in very, very, very much transformative um, ways. Prioritizing equity, uh, resilience, and of course, sustainability, which is at the core of the 2030 agenda. The research map has shown us that we must embed interdisciplinary research into the design implementation, uh, rethinking of COVID-19 socioeconomic recovery efforts, including at the community level when it comes to marginalized populations. And our recovery efforts must involve and prioritize the needs of women who are particularly affected by the, social, uh, the, the economic and social consequences of the pandemic, mostly in the informal sector that's not captured. Um, and uh, with many of our youth now, the largest cohort in many of our developing countries being affected. The research uh, roadmap also bridges um, the, uh, the research and policy gap that we've seen, providing us with an opportunity for the creation of solutions. And let me just say here the co-creation of solutions, because this really needs to be done together, um, all towards that common goal of the framework that we have. We don't need to reinvent any more frameworks or, or, or goals, but um, if we can just work with the one that we have, we can begin to lift it. We're gonna need solutions and global action that's focused, it's coordinated, it's unified. This is a really good first effort of us trying to hear each other um, so that we can feed into what needs to be done in implementation. I know that this conversation today will be the start of this relationship. I really look forward um, to hearing about what exists um, in terms of the commitments, uh, the innovative mechanisms, and how we can really share this, scale it, and get it done sooner rather than later. Uh, our research roadmap is based on the framework that is grounded in field experience of UN agencies. And across 131 countries, uh, you will find those teams in that footprint. Um, and it is open to convene and to bring together the partners, um, of course, accompanied by specific country implementation focus. Um, and here, really mobilizing research that can be expected uh, to be um, relevant for decision makers in government in civil society uh, and the private sector. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting day and I, I look forward uh, very much to hearing um, more uh, from, from uh, our participants today um, and especially as we go to the field um, to implement our 2030 agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Madam DSG uh, for your remarks. I'll now invite a few participants uh, to give two minute interventions, after which I will turn again to you, Madam DSG, for your response to those interventions. We will then continue the dialogue from there. So I now give the floor to Dr. Ted Hewitt, President of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council for his two minute intervention. Dr. Hewitt, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hoffman, uh, also Deputy Secretary General for your leadership uh, and for convening us all here today to discuss how science can help facilitate the pathway to COVID-19 recovery. Uh, bonjour, uh, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur, Monsieur Ray, uh, colleague, uh, c'est un grand plaisir d'être ici parmi vous au nom du Conseil de recherche en sciences humaines uh, du Canada. I, I wanted to start uh, by saying that I think I'd be stating the obvious if I were to recount how scientific research leading to the development of vaccines and effective treatments open widely across borders will help us all rid the planet of this pandemic. And on that front, 
our colleagues in the natural sciences and engineering and the health sciences across all continents are working very diligently. And I'll let others comment on how we achieve that and how we move forward with a more open platform. But my message is somewhat different today because that's only part of the story. What is so often less discussed and what the UN roadmap has so effectively spotlighted was the dire need to apply collaborative thinking about critical human dimensions of the pandemic and the role of the social sciences and humanities to rebuild better in the vaccine aftermath, to recover more equitably, resiliently and sustainably throughout the world. In Canada, my agency, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council has already been funding research into key topics that will help build a better world post COVID. For example, research are investigating, researchers are investigating how COVID has affected women in vulnerable communities, factors affecting trust in democratic institutions, um, the future of labor and education, and factors affecting economic recovery. And we're collaborating with our partner agencies, the Natural Science and Engineering Research Council, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research on specific transdisciplinary pandemic related calls, working diligently to make the results of this work readily available to government and to the public, not just through academic publications, but also regular media updates, informational dashboards and opinion fora. And now we're ready to move effectively to support the UN Research Roadmap in its efforts to promote a much broader collaboration among funding agencies, both domestically and internationally. Through the transatlantic platform, SHRC will work with its funding partners in Europe, the Americas and Africa to launch a COVID-19 signature call entitled Recovery, Renewal and Resilience in a Post-Pandemic World. All applicants will be encouraged to consult the roadmap when developing their proposals and to refer to the roadmap's identified research priorities as appropriate. Importantly as well, reflecting the strong support the roadmap enjoys across Canada's research funding landscape, the Canada Research Coordinating Committee has begun deliberations on how an effective pan-Canadian funding response to the roadmap, one that engages international partners, may be developed through its signature transdisciplinary funding opportunity, the New Frontiers in Research Program. So please stay tuned. So as research funders in Canada, I can affirm that we are ready and actively engaged domestically and with international partners to advance the UN roadmap agenda and very much look to, uh, forward to hearing more about other initiatives developing elsewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hewitt, and congratulations to you and the Transatlantic Partnership uh, Platform for um, being able to make use directly of the UN Research Roadmap in future funding opportunities. That's just fantastic. I'll now turn uh, to Ambassador uh, Ugarelli um, from Peru. Uh, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, good morning to all. Uh, first, I would like to thank Ambassador Ray for convening this important and timely dialogue. In that same vein, I would like uh, also to thank uh, DSG, Amina Mohamed and Dr. Hoffman for their valuable remarks. We also thank all the speakers for their enlightening comments on the importance of science for development, which takes on a special significance in these trying times, where facts and decision-making processes based on science are of utmost importance. This crisis is an opportunity to build back better, foster renewed cooperation mechanisms, and redirect efforts and resources towards targeted research for data-driven responses, with a special emphasis on the poorest and most vulnerable. The Peruvian government is a firm believer in the power of science and its ability to help guide better choices, including macroeconomic and fiscal policies, as well as on gender equality and public services. Suffice to mention, President Sagasti has been a former member of the Board of Governors of the Canadian International Development Research Center, as well as the chairman of the United Nations Advisory Committee on Science and Technology for Development, among others. During the current pandemic, we have been actively engaging on different projects and research opportunities. Our Ministry of Production has recently authorized the commercialization of inexpensive COVID-19 tests made in and by Peruvian firms 
which in turn has been partly funded by the government program Innovate Peru. We have also suited our normative and regulatory systems in order to foster COVID-19 research and have negotiated agreements regarding the transfer of biological materials for research purposes. We are promoting innovating to reactivate a program part of a wider strategy to reactivate the social, economic and health sectors in response to the crisis. Finally, as a middle-income country, we understand that the adverse impacts of the COVID-19 crisis on economic growth and poverty rates affect all of us in different ways. Therefore, we need to understand more precisely how to find channels to mitigate these impacts, taking into account each country's specific situation. Effectiveness of financing strategies, debt relief, FDI, ODA, and finance can be improved for a fairer, greener, and sustainable global economy. I thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. I'll now invite one more comment uh, before we return to uh, Madam DSG, um, and that will be uh, from Professor Katia Becker, who's the president of the DFG German Research Foundation. Professor Becker, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues, the German Research Foundation believes that the roadmap is an impressive testimony of the UN's commitment to overcoming the pandemic. In particular, the roadmap represents a signal and a clear commitment to a science-driven, evidence-based approach to dealing with the consequences of the COVID crisis. Therefore, the Interdisciplinary Commission for Research on Pandemics and the German Committee Future Earth, both set up by the DFG, have published a joint statement in order to share the goals and the values of the roadmap, as well as to incite contributions. The shape and effectiveness of new research and research funding rely heavily on the current knowledge available. And what we know is the long-term result of basic research within each respective field of science and the humanities. To generalize, funding research generated from independent curiosity lays the ground for rapid yet reliable results, not only in the field of vaccine development, but also for coming research demands. That is why the current situation illuminates that the best way to prepare for new and unforeseeable societal challenges, be they biomedical or other, lies within generating a knowledge store that is not yet related to concrete problems, but rather to open questions of knowledge. You can only produce a vaccine if you know the virus. So funding the intrinsic motivation, the curiosity of researchers proves to be the earliest possible crisis prevention and the best way to build research infrastructures that contribute to resilient societies. Furthermore, the DFG has been supporting research for more sustainable societies for many years in various concrete ways. It is also fostering diversity at all levels of research processes and is eager to intensify its efforts to share this ambition with partners worldwide. I believe it is our responsibility as research managers to ensure equitable and sustainable frameworks for global cooperation and a good common understanding of the scientific and funding practices as outlined, for example, in the statements of principles of the Global Research Council. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Becker. Uh, Madam DSG, I'll now uh, return uh, to you for your thoughts on the conversation thus far. The floor is yours. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much to our, our contributors today. So important to see and, and really happy that we have got um, the uh, transatlantic partnership uh, to, to engage with as well. Um, I would say that, you know, as we are thinking about involving people, um, and really getting work done to pivot us in this fork of the road to what should be a better outcome. So the response and the investments we make today for that recovery to be in the right direction and, and hopefully um, perhaps even leapfrog a lot of the goals that we had in the SDGs that were lagging. Um, I would say that there are three, three actions that I, I would 
proffer. Um, one, how we really at this international level, 40,000 feet, how do we go local? Um, and I think we need to pay particular attention to the local levels of government. We tend to go into a country and we stay at the national level and we need to bring this down to the local level and we need to be there for the long- the, I think the, uh, from the Russian um, uh, uh, permanent mission, Ivan Konstantinopoloski, I'm so sorry. Uh, uh, sir, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator and good morning dear colleagues. Uh, we would like to start by extending our gratitude to the Permanent Mission of Canada for organizing this interesting event and the Canadian Institute of Health Research, Mr. Stephen Hoffman and his team that coordinated the preparation of the UN Research Roadmap for COVID-19 recovery in a very tight timeline. Uh, science and innovation have long been a decisive factor for development. International cooperation in this area is one of the key means of fostering the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And it is obvious that effective partnerships of states with, the, with researchers and academia in many ways define our ability to reach the 2030 Agenda, the, its SDGs, also in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, that is why Russia fully supports the valuable dialogue with the scientific community. We, were, we uh, were very interested to learn about the launch of the UN Research Roadmap for the COVID-19 recovery. Uh, we would like to particularly highlight with appreciation such areas of the roadmap as reflections on strengthening of health systems towards achieving universal health coverage, social protection, the vast potential of digital technologies, environmental determinants of health, AMR, and promoting a One Health approach maternal and child health, optimal microeconomic policies to curb the economic recession. Also resonates with us the idea of upholding internationally recognized human rights and full respect of national sovereignty. That said, we would also wish to respectfully share what in our view constitutes some shortcomings of the roadmap, one particular and one systemic. The particular is that the roadmap largely addresses social and economic sciences while not exploring enough uh, the huge potential of fundamental research in other realms of science. The systemic one, in our opinion, is a kind of a lack of inclusivity and balance in the focus of the roadmap. The document says it's benefited from inputs from all over the world. However, the list of contributors shows that some regions of the world have been almost entirely overlooked. Among, others, exam among other examples, we would refer to the fact that uh, there are practically no input from researchers of the countries of the CIS. Unfortunately, this makes the priorities and approaches of some countries high on the agenda of the roadmap, while the opinions of others are excluded. As one example, the situation of people living in developing countries under unilateral coercive measures is not addressed in the roadmap, although explicitly referenced in the UN framework for the immediate socioeconomic response uh, from the pandemic. We observe a similar situation with regard to the terminology and concepts used uh, in the roadmap. A UN branded document is expected to use UN agreed terminology and approaches but unfortunately it is not the case. We would not mention that should it be just a valuable research paper uh, by a respected scientific institute or a joint publication, but we believe that a UN roadmap calls for a slightly different approach, securing its universal uptake. Nevertheless, we share a great deal of messages that the roadmap contains, and we hope that as a product of hard work and commitment of many researchers, it can provide useful food for thought for the international scientific community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Konstantinopolowski. Um, thank you also for criticism. Uh, we take that uh, seriously to heart. Uh, this is a learning process uh, for all of us uh, in the production. So I'm just not saying this just to kind of tick a box, but we really appreciate uh, your comments. And uh, we certainly discuss forward because this roadmap is a living document, as is the socioeconomic response uh, uh, towards uh, then Agenda 2030. So thank you very much. Uh, I have the uh, next uh, speaker is Ambassador Alameda from Brazil. Ambassador, you have the floor. And very nice to meet you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the Permanent Mission of Canada and the United Nations Office for Partnerships for convening this timely and important open dialogue on science for development in the context of COVID-19. And to express my gratitude for the Deputy Vice Secretary General for taking time to, from her busy agenda to be with us today. Can you hear me? Okay, good. It's noteworthy that the UN research roadmap for the, for the COVID-19 recovery was developed in such a short time frame, but in no way at the expense of the quality of its conclusions and recommendations. Brazil appreciates that those responsible for the preparation of the report consulted scientists from developing countries, including experts from my own country. I am convinced that this sort of diversity and inclusion in the consultation process only increases the value of this report. When the pandemic hit, the STI ecosystem in Brazil responded quickly, from vaccines to new applications on mobile devices. It is deeply encouraging to see the number and variety of innovations that are being brought about to deal with the pandemic. In that regard, three issues are crucial, education, infra infrastructure, and support to new and innovative companies. We must invest not only in long life education for our labor force, but also in digital literacy with a focus on women and girls. From that to succeed, we must ensure access to infrastructure for all by updating technologies already available and by broadening the coverage for those that today are still left behind. Finally, we must support new and innovative companies. I believe that the United Nations must lead by example and reevaluate how the linkages between science, technology, and development are discussed. There are several fora responsible for this topic, such as the STI Forum in New York, the CSTD in Geneva, and a variety of in independent efforts by different UN entities. I applaud the Secretary General for appointing a special envoy on technology with high hopes that the envoy will help focus on the UN agenda and provide cohesion to the work of the organization. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Almeida. We have time for a few more. Uh, the shorter you are, the more people can, can speak. Um, I'm very pleased now uh, to have uh, uh, my colleague uh, from WHO, the chief scientist of the World Health Organization, Dr. Sumya Swaminathan, uh, Swaminathan uh, present here. She's just fresh out of a press conference with Dr. Tedra, as I understand. So um, over to you, uh, Sumya. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. And thanks um, to the UNDSG and CIHR for uh, not just hosting this, but also for having developed this research roadmap. So I'd like to make three or four quick points. The first one is about the need for global coordination of research, R&D, product development, manufacturing and distribution of products, particularly those that are needed for you know, global health emergencies or other global public health problems. And I think what we have been able to do over the past year by convening the global scientific community by developing a research roadmap, by developing target product profiles, by working with developers and scientists and everyone has been this unprecedented um, you know, open sharing of knowledge, research data, as we are learning more about the virus, but also the speed at which products have been developed. And I'm speaking particularly of vaccines, but also many, many you know, new types of rapid diagnostic tests and and, and, and also drugs, uh, not so successful perhaps as vaccines, but there has been a lot of research on drugs. And we've been able to, at the WHO, play a role in bringing people together. However, 
you know, there are two things that we can learn from this. One is that the equitable distribution of stuff that comes out is, is still not guaranteed. You see around the world today that we are facing huge challenges in getting vaccines out to different countries, despite the fact we set up COVAX to do this, you know, in April of 2020. That's something the world needs to come together on and agree on an equitable way in which these things will be distributed. And the second is using this model to combat um, problems like tuberculosis, for example, for which there's been such slow progress, despite the fact that one and a half million people die every year of TB, most of them you know, in the middle and lower income countries, and yet we don't have a, a vaccine you know, to, to substitute B, BCG, which was developed 120 years ago, and we don't have as many diagnostic tests as we've been able to develop. So can we think about a global R&D mechanism, a model, which involves governments, which involves the UN, which involves all of the research agencies? We've been working with GLOPIDAR, which is a network of research funders, including the CIHR, that fund research on infectious diseases, and with the private sector, uh, building in the equitable access clauses while funding them, you know, using taxpayer money and public R&D resources. And I, I think this is this needs to be urgently solved, not just for the next this pandemic and the next, but for other public health challenges. The other important area we need to sort out, I think, and where research funders and UN agencies can come together is on the area of data sharing. Data sharing, uh, and the UN has put forward, of course, principles and governance uh, framework for this. But we see today how important genetic sequence data is, uh, why it needs to be uh, quickly shared uh, and put in a public a database. We, we know that data on health, on research findings from clinical trials is important to, to share openly. And we need to develop a federated system that could be used so that data doesn't necessarily physically have to move, but the principles and, and the standards need to be developed for how that would work. And, exa and exa uh, the question again comes of access to the data, but also of benefit sharing. And people who are providing the data must be assured that they will also uh, get the benefits. And then finally, I think on the ethics and the governance frameworks for, for new technologies uh, like artificial intelligence, like um, CRISPR, Cas9 gene editing, and so on, which are going to be realities in the medical and health field very soon. They are already. Again, I think uh, the country, member states, the UN, and research funders need to come together to establish uh, global governance mechanisms and ethical standards that everyone will follow while deploying these new technologies to benefit population health. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sumya, and uh, thanks for you know being with us. It must be also a bit stressful, you know, stepping out, press conference coming back to us. Uh, but I guess that's the uh, advantage also of the of the uh, uh, teleworking. So um, we will move now forward with. Uh, I guess we have time for one or two more um, uh, taking over the floor. Uh, Ranjit uh, Senaratne, the chairman of the National Science Foundation of Sri Lanka, sir, you have the floor. Dr. Senaratne, you're on mute. Yes. Uh, now I can hear you. Many, many, many thanks for the opportunity afforded. Uh, and uh, National Science Foundation has actually strongly committed to promoting research uh, to combat COVID. In this connection, it has uh, constructed a digital platform to harness Sri Lankan expatriates overseas with more than three uh, million across the world. And uh, we have been able to really categorize them into similar interest groups. And uh, we have developed high-end equipment available so that uh, they are, we will minimize expenditure on equipment and make the most of the resources available to address high priority research concerns. Also in regard to funding strategy, since we have now developed database of the scientists available at home and abroad for collaboration, 
we would invite them to really uh, contribute in formulating research proposals jointly to address high priority concerns so that uh, we are getting the best of brains and getting the best out of them to address the concerns in a most effective manner and getting the best out of it. So this has been our strategy of the National Science Foundation Sri Lanka to uh, combat the COVID. Uh, that's briefly my observations. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Senaratne. I'm now looking at our overall chair, uh, Anne-Marie. Do I have time to take maybe one or two more? I still have a long list. Okay, so um, let's move now to uh, Ambassador Butigig from Malta. Ambassador, the floor is yours. I would like to thank the Permanent Mission of Canada and the United Nations Office for Partnership for bringing us together uh, for this important and timely dialogue. It is one more step in the leadership role Canada assumed on this matter within the UN community from the start, to which we are grateful. It is becoming more evident that achieving the sustainable development goals is not possible without science and technology. These can provide us with new solutions to old and new problems. In a world bettered by COVID-19, building back better has gained a growing consensus as the way to recovery. Inherently, this implies that solutions need to reach everyone, leaving no one behind, in line with what a previous speaker suggested to replace back with forward. The pandemic highlighted the need for countries to concentrate on science, technology, and innovation in both policy and practical terms. Research and support opportunities are at the heart of actions undertaken by Malta to help better mitigate the negative impacts of, COVID of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Ministry for Research appointed a steering group for the coordination of post-COVID-19 strategy. The Malta Council for Science and Technology and Malta Enterprise Corporation came up with the COVID-19 Research and Development Fund. The University of Malta undertook a number of research projects, one of them leading to the development of a mask respirator decontaminator for frontline health workers, while another research is looking into the use of technology, social connections, isolation and loneliness during the pandemic, which we are very happy to share. Reinvigorating multilateral cooperation is fundamental to overcome such global challenges. The focus on the pandemic will be less beneficial if climate change mitigation and the advancement of the sustainable development goals are put on some back burner. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, um, uh, so we can really have, as everybody was really super disciplined, uh, I can take a few more. Uh, uh, Ms. Tamina Hazanova, Tajikistan, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. <laughs> dear, dear colleagues, uh, dear um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this timely and productive event. Uh, the current circumstances related with COVID-19 pandemics really require um, uh, international solidarity, cooperation more than ever. Uh, in this regard, Tajikistan also supports such initiatives as a UN roadmap for um, recovery from COVID-19 and uh, such kind of uh, productive and useful dialogues, which gives uh, the um, great platform for exchanging opinions, experiences, and sharing the ways of fighting against destructive challenges. Thank you so much for this opportunity, and I wish you uh, a good day for all of you. Very kind. Thank you very much for your statement. Also, very much to the point. Uh, so we do can we can take a few more colleagues to speak. And uh, uh, Paul Latt, uh, the director of the UN United Nations Research Institute uh, for Social Research and uh, former very dear colleague, uh, Paul, uh, the floor is yours. And probably nice to see you somewhere. We haven't seen each other for quite some time. Paul, maybe you're on mute. Can you hear me? So, um, uh, Paul, maybe uh, you sort out the um, 
uh, the uh, connection. Uh, and then let's move to Kristin Danielsen uh, from the Research Council of Norway. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? I can hear you very well. Thank you. Good. My name is Kristin Danielsen. I'm from the Research Council of Norway. And thank you for giving me the chance uh, to tell you about an initiative taken by the Global Research Council, the GRC. The GRC, already mentioned twice today, is a virtual organization comprised of the heads of science funding agencies from around the world. The GRC is developing a global SDG funding pilot. The pilot will be truly global and include strong involvement and partnerships between high and middle income and low and lower middle income countries. A group of 18 funding agencies from all around the world is now working on the pilot action where the essence is the project should be based on existing or ongoing research and the projects will focus on implementation. The purpose of the pilot is to develop a funding mechanism for advancing knowledge-based innovative implementation of the SDGs at local to regional scale. The projects will include researchers, stakeholders from government, industry and NGOs, and at least one of the partner countries in a project should be a DAC listed country. The operator and secretariat of the pilot is the National Research Foundation in South Africa, who will take over the lead from RCN and Norway actually after today. We all think we will achieve greater impact working together as funding agencies, and I think you will hear more from us. And thank you for the chance to tell about this initiative. Thank you very much, and uh, colleagues, uh, for me now, we will move now to the final part of the session. Um, I will, of course, not make a summary of everything that has been said, but just to say we'll take the DSG by the word and organize a stock take um, of the progress in the implementation of the research um, uh, framework uh, somewhere later, later in the year. I also think that the topic of co-creation and moving the whole discussion downward as much as possible to countries, uh, regions, uh, communities is another topic that several of you have, have mentioned. Um, and uh, so that's an encouragement to everyone uh, to move forward on this. At least I, from my side, can really, really uh, commit uh, to organize something together with Stephen and his team, uh, a consultation in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, and, um, and so we will, we will follow up and, uh, and maybe also check whether that can be done in other regions too, so we can have a more, even by sub-region, a, a more kind of a dedicated discussion on a more context specific. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. And like uh, my colleagues, uh, Stephen and Marie said, also uh, a thousand apologies that we could not accommodate everybody who wanted to speak in the time available, but we'll do, we continue this, we'll have a stock take later in the year and hope that then, uh, you know, those who couldn't speak today will be able to, uh, to make, a, make a contribution. And with that, I would hand over now for the concluding remarks uh, to the Assistant Director General for Science of UNESCO, uh, Shamila Nair uh, Beduel, um, uh, to just uh, give uh, some conclusions from her perspective and kind of one of our, you know, big leaders in the science world uh, that is uh, UNESCO. Shamila, you the very floor much. is yours. Thank you very much, Christian, and good afternoon, good morning to all of you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, gives me great pleasure to meet you here today and speak on behalf of UNESCO. As you're all aware, our forefathers in 1945 put the S in UNESCO to represent all of the sciences, social, natural sciences. And we have seen in this COVID, COVID pandemic that all the sciences had to come together. But beyond that, we have noticed that we need the education, science, communication, and culture to enable society to manage this pandemic. And I want to sincerely thank you and congratulate you for the excellent presentations you have had and sharing with us how you're dealing with the pandemic and the different facets of how one could manage such a pandemic, unusual, unique, and attacking every part of society. Nobody has been immune to this particular pandemic. 
And I think one important point that's been raised in this pandemic is the actual sharing of data. First, bringing citizens closer to science, science closer to citizens, but also the sharing of scientific data in real time. And I think here I would like to share with you a very important initiative put forward by the 193 member states of UNESCO during the 219th General Assembly. In November 2019, the member states called upon UNESCO to draft a normative instrument on open science. Why? Because already at that time it's felt that we need to reduce the knowledge gap that Article 27 of the Declaration of Human Rights calls for access to science and technology to ensure that no one is left behind. It is in this spirit that the Secretariat of UNESCO have been working with stakeholders across the world, social scientists, national scientists, publishing houses, indigenous knowledge people as well, bringing together the different knowledge streams to understand the role of open science today. So what will open science do? Well, the pandemic has shown the world is confronted with an unprecedented pandemic, but this also recalls a scientific humanism in a troubled world. Building back better means putting children back in school. The digital divide has gotten bigger. Getting better and closer to nature as what we at UNESCO call the coalition with nature. Understanding the value of water and valuing water. So building back better calls upon not only the scientists, but the whole of the world and the population to come together. So I would like to simply say that we at UNESCO look forward to working with you and that the principles of open science are really embodied by the scientists who've shared the data openly and freely. And we are recognizing that there is a need for creation and transfer of scientific information. But we also need to call upon scientists across the world to exchange more information with the developing countries. And here I would to appeal as somebody coming from South Africa and I see what's happening in my own country, South Africa. I am appealing to people across the world. We need an, a, a pact for open science, but what does it mean? We need to share data, share information, share the technological innovation and knowledge to ensure that no one is left behind. We had launched in UNESCO last year, the Director General of UNESCO together with the Director General of WHO, as well as Miguel Bachelet from UNHCR, launched what is called the Geneva Call. And this Geneva Call is a joint appeal for open science to ask all stakeholders to join the Solidarity Call to Action and the WHO COVID-19 Technology Access Pool to facilitate sharing of knowledge, intellectual property. Let's ensure that no one is left behind. How can we as societies look each other in the face when the rest of humanity do not have access to the scientific knowledge generated by scientists from the developed world to address this pandemic? We need to join hands together in a spirit of sol solidarity, just like the scientists did. And as somebody said, maybe when we do talk about COVID in the future, we will talk about the solidarity among nations, beyond paywalls, beyond publications, beyond fighting, but real solidarity among the nations. We are talking today about ethics of artificial intelligence, ethics of climate change. Well, even the coronavirus knows no boundaries, just like the sky above us and the global warming. So this is a deal from UNESCO to all the participants here today to exchange knowledge and capacity building with the countries of the South to enable them to meet the challenges that they face today. We cannot build back better if part of the world does not have access to any of the vaccines that you are developing. Every life counts, the life from the South, the life from the North. And this is the ethics of sharing and the ethics of care and reducing the knowledge gap. And we are talking about the scientific humanism and the basic access, human right access to science and technology. So I believe and would like to share with you, join the movement of UNESCO's open science, sign up to it, but ensure that private sector, public sector and nations across the world really walk the talk of solidarity and multilateralism. This is the ethics of care and we need to work together or 2030 will not be a reality. So thank you all very much. It's been brilliant.
fantastic presentations, but I would like to see you walk the talk. We have over 80 centers of excellence in UNESCO. Join us and take your research to the countries that need you. For building back better is not just about vaccines. It's about children in school, digital divide, access to water and access to education, but all living in harmony with nature and our coalition with nature. So join the movement, join the open access, the open science, so that it's not just about access to vaccines, but access to technology for basic living standards. And that is a call from UNESCO today to all the participants, all the UN agencies, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in the UN and outside, join the call and ensure that no one is left behind. Let's walk talk. Thank you very much. And thanks for giving UNESCO a chance to be with you here today. Thank you. Well, thank you, Shamila. Really that passionate statement and that spirit of solidarity and ethics may guide us also, you know, towards the action that you are calling for. And I hand over now back the floor to Anne-Marie because I know they will throw us out very soon from this virtual space. So uh, back to you, Anne-Marie. You're muted. Thank you so much, um, Christian and Shamila for this call to solidarity and your very high, and I think all of our very high expectations that we will walk the talk. Thank you um, for everyone who has been able to join us today. And I recognize we did not get to everyone in this dialogue, which was incredibly rich. And I just want to acknowledge um, some of our colleagues, including the Qatar National Research Fund, um, and the deputy PR of the mission of Japan. We apologize, we were not able to get to everyone and we would like to receive everyone's statements and together we will come out with a meeting note coming um, from this meeting as the deputy secretary general has suggested that we should try to come together and see what kind of progress we've made. And I've really just heard such a dynamic and productive conversation. It proves that science is still our best chance for building forward better from the crisis and that there is no time to start to lift our eyes to the strengthening of multilateral collaborations than now. Before we officially conclude, I would just like to thank the following collaborators for their huge lift in organizing this event. CAI HR, including Stephen Hoffman, Morgan Lay, and Ariane Klassen, the permanent mission of Canada to the UN New York, including Ambassador Bob Ray, Jeff Black, and Marie Helene Rivard, Christian Salazar, um, Volkman, our UN Regional Director for Latin America and the Caribbean, and my team in the UN Office for Partners, Aspen, April, Isabel, Zenep, and all my colleagues from the technical and production side led today by the amazing John Montanero. So we have a lot of work ahead of us um, to co-create, to walk the talk, and to be in solidarity as the SG called yesterday, science and solidarity. We must succeed at both. Thank you very much. And we look forward to connecting with you and continuing this dialogue and really getting to work um, and continuing the work and the collaborations that we have together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and congratulations to all of you. Thank you. Thanks everybody, appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night.